Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Selena. I'm with the IMAS. Um, I'm an exhibits coordinator. Um, again, everybody, welcome um, to the artist talk with Christopher Mignon Fitzgerald. Um, I'm going to be going ahead and recording here. Um, so you're welcome to leave your cameras off. Um, uh, if you want to turn them on, that's also welcome. Um, Chris, you want to go ahead and get started? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, carving out time in your evening to be here. Um, thank you, Selena and Marcelo, for this opportunity all at IMS for making making this happen. Um, like Selena said, my name is Christopher Mignon Fitzgerald. Uh, I am the artist behind the current exhibition entitled Processing. And I'm currently sitting in, in my studio uh, here in Northeast Austin. And I'll just, I'll start by providing some personal context and then move uh, toward a wider historical context for why, why I produce the kind of art that I make. Um, to some degree, I, I would say there's this preconceived notion that's rather common that artists choose what we want to create and enjoy doing so, kind of like uh, choosing a favorite movie to watch or something. Uh, but the reality of the artistic enterprise, at least in, in my opinion, in its unadulterated form, is that our life experiences drive what kind of art making we pursue, um, regardless of, of the psychological difficulty involved. Um, so assuming that those of you um, present this evening have seen or read about my exhibition online, um, I'm going to take this time to highlight some aspects, I guess some, some some parts of my work that have not been touched upon. And then I'll show you a few new paintings I'm currently working on, uh, answer questions that were submitted uh, to the museum. Does that sound good, Selena? All right. That sounds good, yeah. <laughs> I certainly experienced my own share of near-death encounters in childhood, but these themes were not at the forefront of my work until uh, roughly 2009, when my wife and I visited her grandfather within a week of his passing. And it just seemed appropriate to put aside the artwork that I was making at the time and create a watercolor portrait of him. This is what you're looking at. Um, it was not about remembering him in this particular way, but rather it was to show that there is dignity at the end of one's life and to magnify his right to be valued in his suffering. The title, uh, Rhythm Unending, refers both to the sound of oxygen pumps through a breathing apparatus and the promise of hope um, in his life continuing beyond physical death. So this is Cleo, a, a public school teacher for most of her life, and a mother of an artist friend of mine, uh, John Cobb. Watercolor, as I, as I said in the exhibition and the recording, is this medium that has this beautiful way of, of, of staining the paper while conveying uh, fragility. And while when we analyze artwork, whether it's subconscious or otherwise, is we're seeking a metaphorical connection between the artist's chosen material, in this case, watercolor, the way that the material is manipulated uh, in the subject matter. This is Uncle Carl. So Carl Torello, uh, during the 70s and 80s, was head of the Warner Brothers Fire Department in Burbank, California which meant that that he was on the set of their movies, Hollywood blockbuster movies, um, governing the pyrotechnics uh, with his booming Italian voice and personality. And he had this kind of demanding, uh, powerful presence, which I think is perfect for that that role, you know, for that, that kind of occupation, kind of like a, a six foot five mobster, you might say. He was a big guy. And uh, not too many years ago, I did these paintings of Carl shortly uh, before he died from uh, chronic leukemia. 
And it's difficult to witness um, a person going from strength and health to a state of well, weakness in, in a brief period. Dr. Bernie Gassler here was the founder of Austin Children's Choir and a professor at Concordia University. And it's, it's really been my privilege to paint everyone I've known personally um, or through family friends, uh, although limited because not everyone around me is passing away uh, continually, thank God. Uh, for a few years, I enlisted two surgeon friends of mine um, who are head and neck like trauma surgeons, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. And their no normal protocol, and this, this began to take place once like, you know, cell phones were very common, right? was to take photographs as they were working to document the surgical and patient progress, which I just had no idea that's what they did. Um, but they told me so. And, and later they would, they would ask the patient and families on my behalf if the photos could be shared as reference for painting. So I received, whereas Dr. Gassler here was like in person, you know, um, right here in Austin. Um, but I did receive a lot of imagery of individuals uh, being treated for traumatic accidents, depictions of ICU patients on life support machines. And meanwhile, um, not everybody knows about this work, but I began to explore these situations through shooting short films with actors, uh, makeup artists, and, and building staged environments. And I used this as a starting point for a few uh, of the paintings, which were, were quite literal renderings, as you can see from the portrait on the right. So the, the films themselves became an important part of my investigation alongside painting. For, I don't know, I'd say about, about 10 years or so. I mean, not just in terms of trauma and suffering, but also the relationship between the cinematic telling of a story and the narrative devices that are found in the history of painting. So above is a shot from one of my films and below is an analogous composition found in Mantegna's Lamentation of Christ uh, from the Renaissance era. And these are a few more of my film stills. Um, they really emphasize this mystery that, that I see as inherent in technologies grafted to the human body. So when I was facing my mortality as a, as a child in the hospital, these kinds of machines were used to save my life. But, you know, I, I had no idea how the machines worked, you know, and this is, this still greatly intrigues me because it's like, um, it's like most technology we use. There's very few of us who have a comprehensive awareness of the underlying mechanics. Most of us simply, don't know what to do when our car breaks down, you know, or what to do when our when our phones glitch out because we strictly deal uh, with the interfaces and rely on specialists to figure out like what's actually going on. So my work has become very much also about the the life saving technology as 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 a signifier. Of the for the extent that we go to to preserve those we we want to save those we love and and if you think about caregivers in hospitals and 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 their patients they're they're um they're often strangers you know um, and so when i'm when i'm back in the studio and i'm working out the small portraits of patients I'm utilizing a combination of brushes, uh, syringes, I'm soaking, I'm injecting. Um, in a sense, I'm putting the image out of control, which forces me to uh, act quickly, um, blotting, erasing, excavating the surface. You know, I'm just trying to keep the image alive, you know, and, and even using razor blades and cutting the surface 
Um, I've accidentally cut myself a few times. <laughs> and it's a bit like surgical cuts to, to kind of resurrect the image, just saying. Um, so my overall, my overall uh, aesthetic approach, maybe some, some of you might recognize this work here. It's, um, it's, it's deeply in, indebted to capturing light the way that John Singer Sargent did as you see on the left with his watercolors, uh, the, the rhizomatic uh, compositions in, of, of Joan Mitchell, uh, especially her mid-career work. And seeing Sargent's work both at the Seattle Art Museum um, and later at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, I realized there could be this, this kind of gravitas, this power if these kinds of marks were magnified uh, to a monumental scale. Um, a sort of fugitive quality that I wanted to see preserved and amplified. And so that's exactly what I began to do. Uh, people will often uh, comment about the elusive quality uh, in the larger paintings, noting how um, it takes time with the larger ones to, to recognize the imagery. The, the lack of deciphering what one is seeing is really analogous to our inability to resolve confusing moments of our existence. There's a, there's of course a certain literalness to of the imagery that's required to anchor, anchor, I would say, uh, me as the artist and, and you as the viewer. Um, but the application of paint, the way it's manipulated, and your reading of it becomes the, the mechanism for making sense of it all. So this perceptual delay is of prime importance to me because it's, it's not about it's not about the veracity, you know, the believability of painting pitted against a photograph. And it's not about how the image is collectively consumed through contemporary media, like Richter or Luke Tymon's work. It's my concern is, is primarily with how the image is constructed in the human mind and how it's assigned personal significance. So this is something I would um, align with thinking as, as a kind of a mental portal, if you will. So on the one hand, there's a delay in perception. And at first, you know, you're thinking, okay, this is a pleasing puzzle, but what the heck am I looking at, right? And, and then you have the subject matter that's gradually functioning almost in, in layers, kind of delaminating as you're as you're looking at the work as a metaphorical carrier of information. So the human face, uh, the psychology of the cinematic close-up, uh, the life support apparatus. And I'm, in, I'm intrigued with near-death encounters that I would broadly define in colloquial terms as having um, an experience that renders your own mortality in, 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 in sharp focus. Um, I'm not necessarily approaching these pictures through a supernatural lens or from a strictly medical scientific framework because I believe the power in painting categorically resides, and this is in all art really, in between the psychological and the conceptual. In, in, in other words, um, when a painting is successful, the experience of both making and looking at it transcends the emotions and the logic-based language we used to describe it. And this is why painting, which is rather old, um, can remain archaic, can remain low-tech while also being contemporary and challenging, which is, is um, what I love about it. And to do painting now it's kind of a it, it's it's a real challenge because there's so much it's so much uh, historical baggage to it and it's um 
It's making a statement even in our moving image saturated culture, right? Um, in the middle of the pandemic, our closest friends, um, a husband and wife died in the, the inferno of a head-on collision with a truck. And this was another turning point for me. I mean, if you've ever had someone close to you uh, pass away, all of a the sudden there's there comes there comes like a clarity of what is important in life, what really matters to you, and uh, what is worth pursuing. You know, with your time, since more time to be living is not guaranteed. My personal like clarity of vision came with um, blending our families together, adoption, and professionally, it was the conscious decision to focus entirely on painting rather than the hyper real techniques of filmmaking. And that brings us to my more current work. So if it's okay with you, Selena, um, I'll share a few thoughts about my new paintings and then actually move around <laughs> and show you the studio. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, great, great. Uh, let's see, I can show you a few images on the slides first. So this is a painting in progress, I think. <laughs> so uh, not sure if it's done quite yet, um, in, in part because it's it's recognizable a little too quick. I think. Um, I'm, so I'm still portraying patients, but I'm also beginning to expand my subject matter to include uh, what I would call the epic environments in which these events come about. Um, the process of painting, which is essentially the title of the exhibition, is my way to think through reconciling um, the, the often, I would, I would say the often simultaneous feelings we can have of awe and terror, beauty and disgust, wonder and horror. Um, so the, the, the creating a picture is kind of a stripped down method for current, uh, confronting a, um, a cognitive dissonance that we have about these things. And, you know, I'm tempted to say that that if you want to move beyond merely appreciating paradox in life, beyond merely, uh, I'd say, appreciating mystery, to actually make contact with what is transcendent, good, true, and dare I say, beautiful, you must spend time focusing your attention on what is undeniably tragic. Um, and it, that's at least where I come from in in uh, in my making of the work as 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 I see my vocation as an artist. Okay. Wow, that's a lot. So here we have a a black and white digital sketch for my newest painting, which I'm going to show you. It's uh, twelve feet wide by nine feet high. So it's 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 definitely my largest painting to date. Instead of referencing a specific event, this comes from my imagination. So that street does not actually exist. In fact, it's multiple streets come together. Um, those trees do not exist. Uh, nor does the bike burning. It was all collaged together. And I'm now embarking on a series of these uh, large scale paintings. Selena, did you want to inject anything be before we take a brief tour around the studio? And then after that, I'll answer some some of the questions submitted. Um, I think we're good now. Um, so far, no, no questions in the chat. Um, can, can you say again what medium you used for, for this one that you're showing right now? A jamming together of many images, photographs from which I pull online through license-free imagery, um, images I take myself, and then 
some sketches and watercolor studies kind of all merged together in Photoshop. Which can take a while, by the way. It's not exactly a quick um, yeah, process. So a sec here. So after I executed the small uh, watercolor preliminary work where I was just sitting um, and any additional manipulation in Photoshop, the, the next step um, has been involving this, this mixing, pre-mixing of acrylic colors as tinting agents for the gesso, the primer. Um, the goal is to have the large canvas underpainting take on the appearance of a stained or a faded image on paper. And then I proceed to spray the pure white gesso over the entire image. It's kind of like a transparent, like semi-transparent veil. As you can see, um, I think in this painting, for me, it's, it's really a method for describing bright light. As a, as a way to achieve a kind of phantasmagoria, the dreamlike state that comes with waking up after surgery. This, this sort of um, atmosphere of manifold, nuanced uh, light. Um, and what that does, it really presents us with what we cannot entirely see, what we cannot entirely understand. And so, the process, what I'm keeping in mind is these kind of, these open set of parameters where there's this constant oscillation between overexposure and the process of the image becoming something that is knowable, something that you can grasp. And then finally, um, I use water-soluble oil paints to bring out that, that the detail work that you're seeing is kind of like emerging out of that um, mysterious kind of vague space. And if you've been in surgery or an accident, there are, you know, this kind of a disorientation that's intrinsic kind of to the experience of it. And, and, and so the detail work is also, you know, to provide that anchor that, that anchor that you don't feel totally lost um, and the brushwork is rooted in my experience working with watercolors. Although I don't always spray the paintings, um, like I was speaking. In fact, the new one that I'm going to show you now, um, I don't think I'm going to spray it. I think that the atmosphere is working out well. But I still have that, that kind of veiled atmosphere. This one's not complete. It's in progress. I have not done the detail work in it, but you can kind of, um, you can get the, the feel for what's, what's there. And this is where I was going when I was talking about kind of epic environments. Uh, so if I'm, if, if I were to reverse engineer my intuition about this painting, it definitely has to do with some recent, you know, incidents involving people close to me. Uh, also, my own decision not to buy a motorcycle, even though I would like one, uh, out of safety concerns for being a husband and a father. And there's also this connection to my formative years, you know, where I grew up. The environment represents the sublime forest areas of the Northwest. Um, there's this uh, French, late French, who just passed away recently, uh, cultural philosopher Paul Virilio. Uh, who famously said something to the effect that the invention of the automobile is equivalent to the invention of the auto accident. And um, the, the ship, the construction of the ship is essentially the construction of the shipwreck. That is to say that technology has a, a kind of built-in promise of progress and it comes at a cost. But the cost is, is you know, it's even higher when you accelerate to greater speeds of innovation, you know, with the industry and e ecology innovations of the 20th century and now with biotechnology in the 21st century, um, 
Some argue that the COVID-19 pandemic was an example of this. Um, it even relates to our situation this year of uh, as far-fetched as it seems, you know, we have high profile innovators signing petitions, you know, to halt the next development of chat GPT, right? Until we have greater evaluated the risks involved with AI. So this, this painting comes out of thinking about our societal notions of progress, like crashing around us. Um, and the, the underlying motif of all my work is this collision of the natural with the technological, both you know, when they coalesce and, and when there's tragic failure. <laughs> that, um, I suppose I could go into answering some, some questions. Um, I have a few here that were submitted. Someone submitted a question. They said, when reading about you and your art on the museum website, I took from it uh, was that you treat your, your art the same way patients in intensive care units care or intensive care are treated by the doctors and nurses. Is this correct? Kind of align the two. Um, so just to be clear, um, this is this is only insofar as an analogy for for undertaking an intense, careful process. Literally, my work is nothing like the heroic caregivers caregivers that you know work day in day out uh, and attend to real people. I'm simply uh, creating um, visual artifacts meant to function with a, a poetic uh, response. Um, one of the submitted comments, um, to, I'll paraphrase it because it's a bit long, um, points out the, the stark kind of contrast between a gallery space and showing the work in a gallery space and what the emergency room is like and follows up with, a, with questioning, are the pieces made for viewers to reflect on their own lives and loved ones that have been in similar situations. So um, it might surprise you, but my answer is no, <laughs> the short answer. Uh, the, picture, the pictures are, are, are actually intended for people who have, have not been in these kinds of situations. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's for everyone because I think we all need that kind of introspection and time to reflect. But it's it, in in the way I approach it. It's in order to offer moments of introspection similar to those of us who have been in these situations. And in regard to showing the work in gallery spaces, um, I I have focused mostly on exhibiting the paintings in academic institutions, universities, and only recently. Have I considered uh, gallery or museum spaces mostly because the body of work I think is ready for a wider like, audience. Um, and then I'll just hit this. There's there's a few more, but they can they can kind of be combined. Um, I think uh, so that a few people asked asked about cognition, uh, which I've already I think touched on quite a bit. Um, and emotions, like what emotions emanate when creating your work, also in the end when it is finished. Um, so there's there's definitely a lot of I would say anxiety um, for me before I begin um, because. Part of it is is just that it doesn't feel like I made the paintings when I look at my previous watercolors, um, because uh, I never trained in watercolor. I never really learned how to use watercolor, so I just kind of uh, and it's also like an entry um, entry art form. Like a lot of people who haven't made much art have at least used watercolor, right? And I use it as a kid, like everyone else has. And I think there there was something that stuck with it for me. So it, it, it's true, though, that every single time that I approach making a painting, I'm convinced that I'm going to fail. 
I'm thoroughly convinced that I'm going to fail. So there's a lot of anxiety with that. Um, and I try to see that the labor of creating the work is also an act of compassion based on like, you know, I'm looking, I'm studying, I'm putting time into uh, imagery of what is painful and suffering for other people and their families, which I think that compassion tends to grow in the process for me. And there's, there's honestly also like a bit of relief when I'm done for sure. I think that's what I got from what was submitted. So however you want to take this, this now, I don't, I, I suppose I can bring up the chat. Maybe I can do that. Right. Let's see. Yeah. If you, if you can't see it, I'm welcome. I'm happy to read them for you. Oh, I got it now. So let's see. Brian knocking <laughs> says, uh, it was intrigued with a statement earlier on about the thought it was important to confront the tragic to get um, to what is true, good, and beautiful. Can I expand on that idea? Um, hmm. it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, it's hard. It's in, in, in part, making the making the paintings is for sure a way to almost like talk about what I can't talk about or put into words. Um, I can, I, I will say that I'm also inviting that connection with the titles that I use. So I can, I can maybe talk about the titles and how those um, are, are in a, an attempt to offer up a, uh, that connection beyond just um, appreciating something that's 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 distance and distant and that is um other to use a very postmodern term other otherness you know so there was um henry nowen um and i think brother lawrence was a monk from like the 1600s that that really said it best that we we all have this kind of running internal monologue going on and turning it into a in, into an ongoing conversation with our creator is a is a is a transformative and rich way to live life. Um, so the phrases that I use as titles uh, for my work are chosen to invoke a sense of kind of the private made public. It's an opportunity. Um, the way that Terrence Malick, let's say, orchestrates the dialogue in his movies. It's it's this kind of um, the inner thoughts made known, and I also I also use the the Spanish um, as well as the English because I you know I feel that English just like titling something untitled or no title, um, English also has a kind of truncation of the experience because it's a very direct transactional language, um, whereas Spanish um, you know commonly spoken and in my household as well. Um, it's it's just a bit more poetic, more open to interpretation, I'd say. So I guess that's how I'd answer that. Um, making making a, a, uh, a connection. I would, I would okay, I'm gonna add one more thing. <laughs> and, and and that is again going back to where you don't know what you're looking at at first, but maybe there's there's a feeling that you're looking at something that is touching on beauty. Not just pretty, but it transcends that to something that is more uh, indescribable. And 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 once you, I think, psychologically get to that step of being open to what you're looking at, and then the imagery begins to come together, um, you have something that I would say, how would you call it, kind of in, in, imports it imports something true about having compassion for others, even strangers, because all artwork starts out as a stranger to you. If you think of artwork as another person in front of you, right? There's a kind of like, let's, there's small talk, and then there's like getting, getting past that to, to more. So, okay, that was kind of a long <laughs> response. Maybe I can shorten my responses a bit. Um, that's great. 
Um, we do have uh, someone raising their hand, Marcelo. Whenever you're ready, you can unmute yourself. Yes. So thank thank you very much for giving us a tour of of your process and, and of your studio. I'm a really big fan of when I saw the virtual exhibit that cleat hitch uh, thing you have with the pulley system to to move the canvases when you're working in large scale. I thought that was amazing. I was like, I want one of those. <laughs> yeah, it's essentially like um, two barn door rails that are attached instead of vertical. You know, the barn door where you slide it, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's like this way and then this way and it had to be really precise. And then, so it's like, you know, some kind of makeshift barn door that's gone gone haywire, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that it, MacGyvering is artists that we constantly have to do. But uh, I guess just kind of, I have a myriad of questions, but I'll kind of narrow mine down to, to one to give other people a chance. So you talked about sure. uh, the clarity that comes along with with being involved in this type of traumatic experience or having someone very close to you being taken away suddenly. And mm -hmm. given that the viewer has to kind of break down visual barriers to literally create a clear, like a clear image of, of what they're viewing in their mind, is this kind of a theme that you want to bring about in your paintings? Do you want the the viewer to also feel this clarity of of you know narrowing narrowing down what is important to you in life because of that very fragile balance between life and death because really these images are really what that interplay looks like we always say that kind of cliche word we walk this fine line between life and death but this is what it what it literally looks like so I, maybe you can expand on that yeah that 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 clarity um I think I think I do I do seek after that kind of like carpe diem seize the day kind of experience for myself you know um I think for me doing this this body of work and continuing in the way that I am there's there's I don't I don't I feel like for myself that I take things for less for granted. So when I look into the eyes of my daughter and my my sons, there's a, there's a sense that the the temporary um, invokes even more sense of like meaning and uh, beauty, um, knowing that they're going to also die someday, right? Um, so it's a lot of it's it's a lot of heavy stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, it's definitely a very very heavy topic. You're dealing with with people who are on, on this edge, on this fringe edge of of life and death, and recognizing that yes, as humans, we are we are temporary, as you as you just said, that life life is finite. Even though we may have these projects, these offices, this what have you, that make us seem larger than life, but at the same time, you know, these these pieces yeah. kind of help us recognize that 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 fragility yeah and and i do you know it's it's not to also i i don't when i say you know open parameters it's also you know in terms of the techniques i use but also in inviting the viewer to you know if they want to look and read the work through more of like a spiritual lens or this is like a transition or a portal into um an afterlife that's fantastic um and from kind of the the clinical history if you look at like um jean foucault the, the another french philosopher these guys um with birth of the clinic uh with the the, the really difficult to read unless you're a philosopher but it's it's shocking to to um to realize that it's such a recent history we only like in the last 150 200 years that that we've moved the medical field from one of alchemy to like an exact science, you know. On on the other hand, we we still understand end of life care, kind of like an alchemist. I mean, and and perhaps that is more like fully appropriate, you know, because of out outside of what is pharma pharmaceutically like minimizing physical pain, there's this entire realm of human experience residing in in the poetic, in the beautiful, in the suffering, in the transcendent, and by its 
very definition, definition, I should say, residing outside of, of like the, the framework of just science or just the, what is temporary meaningful. I, guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the, the thoughts and comments. It's really- Yes, of course. Yeah, very thank, thank you very much for, for answering. Chris, thank you so much uh, for your time. We really appreciate it um, and answering questions and showing us around your studio. Thank uh, you all for showing up. Good night, everyone.